There are times in life that we experience things and people, whether good or bad, that impact us or make an indelible impression on our lives. And sometimes such is the impact of those experiences we've had that we come to the point of no discussion because we feel what occurred was either too embarrassing or too painful to recall. So we don't and we won't discuss it. And then there are those experiences that are ours and ours alone. And we care not to share them. So when our mood or behavior or something perhaps in our communication changes from what is considered normal for us, inquiring minds want to know, so they ask. Mm -hmm. And if we decide that we don't want to discuss the subject matter or most definitely discuss it with a particular person or people, we will respond by saying either, I don't want to talk about it, or it's personal. All right. All right. I'm reminded of a story where there were three pastors. One was a Baptist, one was Methodist, and the other was Pentecostal. All right. These pastors were good friends, and they decided that they would take some downtime and go on a fishing trip. While fishing, one of the pastors came up with an idea for a pastime. He suggested that they reveal their sins one to another. And they all agreed to do it. Now, the Methodist pastor confessed that he goes to bars and drinks and sometimes gets drunk. The Pentecostal pastor confessed that he was having an affair with a woman in town. And then there was a long silence and the Methodist pastor looked at the Pentecostal pastor and then they both looked at the Baptist pastor and said to him, well, we told our stuff, what about you? And the Baptist pastor said, oh, I'm sorry. I confess that I'm the town gossip and I cannot wait to get back to town. Sometimes, oh. beloved, <laughs> sometimes, beloved, it's, it's just best to keep some things to yourself. Your stuff is just that. Your stuff. I know the scripture instructs us to confess your faults one to another, but there has to be some wisdom in place in the execution of that word. Because we must remember that everyone, first of all, is not trustworthy and does not qualify as a confidant. Secondly, everyone cannot handle what you divulge, nor are they qualified to. And some things are just not things to be shared. In other words, everything concerning us is not everybody's business. We may be called upon to be transparent in this hour, yes, but not naked. Our nakedness is reserved for God and not anyone else. Why? Because it's personal. Now I sought to define personal, thank you, and the dictionary resource I used gave me two definitions. I will share the second, which falls more in line with our consideration for today. Personal is defined of or concerning one's private life, relationships, and emotions rather than matters connected with one's public or professional career. The category of the personal I would like to address is the relationship category. Somebody say the relationship category. The relationship category. I would like to zero in on one having a personal relationship with God. Yeah. And I will begin with my own testimony. 
47 years ago, at the age of 13, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord of my life under the ministry of the late Billy Graham. When I gave myself to Jesus, I understood the part where Christ is my Savior, but wasn't clear yet on the personal part. I was brought up to fear God, but the fear I was taught bordered more on fear as in being afraid. I was afraid of God rather than reverencing God. So I was basically scared of God. I was scared of God, I was scared of being lost, I was scared of going to hell. So my overall relationship with God was initially based on fear. So several years later, I was still saved, and by this time I had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I was now a young adult in age, but I wasn't as mature in the things of the Spirit and the way of God as I was in the natural. So I found myself in a bad spiritual state. Oh, I went through the motions in church of talking the talk and shouting the shout, but not walking the walk. I wasn't living the life that I had professed. So the fear I had was still there, but it was now dormant. Over time, I had taken on things, practices, and behaviors that did not become one professing godliness. My conscience was becoming seared seemingly with a hot iron, whereas when the conviction that would make me contrite or broken and repentant was becoming less and less effective. People who knew me and who knew me well knew <laughs> something was obviously wrong with me. So one day, one precious saint was talking to me about myself. And in her sharing, she told me that I wasn't saved and that I needed deliverance. And went on to share with me that Jesus didn't love me in the state that I was in. Oh Beloveds, I heard everything she said. But that part when she said I wasn't saved, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. Right. My salvation experience to me was like the Apostle Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. Right. I didn't care what anybody said. I knew that cold night in January of 1972, God saved Anthony Freeman Burgess. All right. All right. So I was disturbed being told I was not saved. I could deal with the deliverance part, but don't tell me I wasn't saved. Right. So early the next morning, somebody say early the next morning. Early. early the next morning, it wasn't even daybreak yet. I was awakened by the most beautiful singing. There was no radio or no TV on anywhere, but this singing filled the room. And as I listened and marveled at the beautiful harmonies of that heavenly choir, I heard these words, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak. But he is strong. Now, what made this significant to me was not just it coming at the time that it was coming, but when I was a child at five years old, this was the solo that I had to sing with the junior choir. And so God took those words, amen, to minister to me. And this part, beloved, is what tore me up altogether. Yes, Jesus loves me. Y'all not going to help me today. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Can I get a witness in here? The emphasis was on the fact that Jesus loved me. As flawed and messy as I had become, Jesus never threw me away. 
He loved me. People rejected me. But Jesus loved me. I wonder if I by myself did anybody else here been in that kind of position and found that Jesus loved you in spite of yourself? Because see, I know we sitting up here religious today, but we ain't always been where we are today. So we thank God that in spite of ourselves, Jesus loved us. Somebody give God a praise right there. As unacceptable as I was, Jesus still loved me. It was then, that very morning, y'all, that I realized the personal in the term personal Savior. It was then that the fear that rendered me afraid of God now turned to reverence, high regard, and most of all, love for God. I serve him and live for him out of my love for him, not because I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't, but because he first loved me. I Hallelujah. I want to love him back. And I don't know if anybody noticed that I didn't use pronouns such as we and us. But I use I, me, and mine. Why? Because it's personal. Y'all not going to help me today. It's my testimony. You can't tell it like I can. I love Jesus. He's my saint. Y'all not going to help me. When storms are raging, he's my shelter. They are my shot. Where he leads me. I will follow. I love Jesus. Anybody love him here? Hallelujah. And he loves me. Don't push me. Hallelujah. Because it's personal. Oh, I tell the Lord, thank you. Look at somebody and tell him it's personal. No, y'all ain't saying with enough attitude. Somebody say it's personal. Oh, yes, it's personal. The Lord is my shepherd. Hallelujah. And I shall not want because it's personal. The Lord is my light. Hallelujah. And my salvation. Why? Because it's personal. The Lord is my son. Y'all not going to help me. And my shield. Why? Because it's personal. Humble shot. The Lord is the shade upon my right hand. Why? Because it's personal. The Lord is my glory and the lifter up of my. Why? Because somebody tell the Lord thank you. Come on, tell him thank you again. Hallelujah. First, I, I, I need. I need to tell you a few things that I want you to remember as I'm drawing to a close in this message. Hallelujah, the first thing that I want you to remember is that your relationship with God is personal. It's an A and B thing. And people need to see their way out of it. Have I got a witness here? I remember growing up singing the Charles Austin Miles hymn in the garden. Hallelujah, where he said, I come to the garden alone. Come, y'all not gonna help me. While the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. Ah, but this is the part right here. And he walks. Hey, with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me, hallelujah, I am his own. Hallelujah, and the joy that we share, hallelujah, as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Somebody tell the Lord, thank you. It's personal. I said it's personal. Secondly, I want you to remember that people have a tendency to overstep their boundaries by determining God's dealings with you by God's dealings with them. 
Beloved, it must be understood that we are all uniquely designed. We have similarities, but none of us are the same. All of us have different and distinct purposes for which we were created. And we all have destinies in the earth. Somebody tell them thank you. How God deals with us individually to bring us to our expected end is his doing. And it's not by anyone's determination. God has the final say. Tell the Lord thank you. He is the one who will take one down and set up another. He is the one that when man says no, he turns around and says yes. And sometimes he won't have another say yes, but he'll have the same mouth that told you no. He'll have him say yes. Y'all not going to. Why? Because it's personal. Oh my God, help me here. Hey, the third thing that I want you to remember, hallelujah, that your vertical affects your horizontal. You're not going to help me. Your vertical, hallelujah, affects your horizontal. Vertical is up and down, while horizontal is across. Vertical would be your relationship with God, while horizontal is your relating to the world. There are many that claim that they have a vertical relationship, but they seem to have no horizontal effect. Therefore, rendering their claims as null and void, and that is not a judgment call, beloveds. It's the fruits identification of what kind of tree you really are, despite your claim. Y'all not going to help me today. Jesus was the primary example of a vertical relationship, having horizontal effect. Every time he go aside and pray, his humanity would connect with his divinity yeah. and he come from prayer doing exploits yeah. especially in his last prayer session oh, yeah. in the garden of Gethsemane oh, yeah. he was about to do his greatest exploit yeah. am I saying yes yeah. he had performed hallelujah the greatest exploit to date yeah. And it was called Calvary. Yeah. I might say yes, Lord. Yeah. I can hear the words of a man by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman. He said something like this. One day when heaven was filled with his praises. One day uh, when sin uh, was as black uh, as could be, uh, Jesus uh, came forth uh, to be born uh, of a virgin. Uh, he dwelt uh, among men. Uh, my example uh, is he. Uh, why? Uh, because it was personal. Uh, one day uh, they led him uh, up Calvary's uh, mountain. Uh, one day uh, they nailed him uh, to die uh, on the tree. Uh, he was suffering uh, anguish. Uh, he was despised uh, and rejected. Uh, he was bearing uh, our sins. Uh, Am I saying yes? Can I preach it? Just a couple more minutes. One day, they left him alone in the garden. Can I talk about it? One day, he rested from suffering. He was free. Angels came down or his tomb ha, to keep the vigil ha, hope of the hopeless my savior ha, is he ha, why ha, 